Hey folks, and welcome to this week's News and Community Spotlight. All aboard for this month's free marketplace content. Make it rain with in-depth rain systems and then take to the water on pirate ships. Be sure to secure the ropes with a physical interaction system before leveling up into classy offices. Remember to grab this month's content fast, it's only free until the end of November. Ever wondered what it would be like to be deserted on your very own deluxe tropical island? Well now you can with Low Poly Style Deluxe 2, now a part of our permanently free content. Last week, we announced the winners of the 2022 Epic Mega Jam. And now to show you the piping hot sizzle of the winning entries. Watch the whole sizzle on the feed, then get your game on with the 17 awesome finalist games. If you couldn't make it to Unreal Fest, or if you want to rewatch anything you saw, you can check out recordings of the sessions. Dive in and explore all the action from Unreal Fest 2022. We'll be adding more recordings over the coming weeks, so watch this space at unrealengine.com slash events. Head to unrealengine.com slash feed to discover how UCLA staff and students created an immersive AR theater experience set in the world of the man in the high castle with the help of Unreal Engine and Blueprint systems. Is AR the future of theater entertainment? To improve the operational efficiency of Busan Port, one of South Korea's largest hubs for maritime logistics, Sanwoo Immersion developed the Valos Terminal Monitoring System, a digital twin combined with an interactive IoT platform. Dive into how and why it was made on the feed. Moving over to this week's Community Spotlights. With their latest tech demo, UE Wizard Scene showcases the ability and beauty of both Lumen and Nanite in 100 lights rotate. Featuring barren, lush, and varying states of urban settings, they've done an illuminating job of showing how lighting can be used to create completely different vibes in the same scene. Watch in full on their YouTube channel. In a mind-bending puzzle adventure by Stubby Games, where you reverse objects through time to overcome seemingly impossible obstacles and conundrums. Can you manipulate time to your will and solve ingeniously challenging puzzle rooms, each one taking you closer to the heart of a colossal space station in orbit of Earth? Let's find out! Wishlist the Entropy Center on Steam. Environment artist Anton Egg has challenged themselves with their latest piece, drawing inspiration from popular fan theories, vague mentions from A Song of Ice and Fire, and a boatload of their talent and technical skill with an Unreal Engine. We're sure you'll all agree this is a phenomenal scene. Let them know what you think of a shy by the shadow on their art station. Thanks for watching. Catch you next week. Hello everyone and welcome back to Inside Unreal, a weekly show where we learn, explore, and celebrate everything Unreal. I am your host Tina and today with me I have two incredible guests. First off, Ryan, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself? Hi, I'm Ryan. I'm the lead developer and animator and character designer on Flint Butler Wakes Sleepy Castle. Fantastic to have you here. There's so many titles that you just listed. <laughs> Yeah, we're we're a tiny team, so we, we, we do what we can. Both of us wear a thousand hats each. Yes, lots of hats. <laughs> <laughs> and then next, and certainly not least, Daniel, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, yeah. So I do level and game design, music, sound, and a bit of production stuff on the project. Um, joined earlier this year full time. Before that, I was just working as solely the composer. And over time, I just became more and more involved in the project. Um, and yeah, here we are. That's awesome. I love that. <laughs> so you've earned your hats over time, is what I'm hearing. <laughs> yeah, he revealed them over Remains time. Remains to be seen. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, yeah, I no, know um... before we... Uh... Oh, no, go ahead. What were you saying? No, yeah, I was just going to say, like, it seems like we both just kind of had all these skills laying around and we just, like, both kind of complement each other perfectly as far as, like, what we can add to the project. And so, yeah, we, we make a good team. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. absolutely. Perfect pair for game making. <laughs> for sure. Well, before we dive too deep into the topic today, I know that you both brought us an incredible trailer. Do we want to take a look at that before we dive in? Let's do it. Let's do it. I'm not hearing anything. Yeah, I can't hear anything. I, I oh, was muted. It's bad. That's why. <sighs> Let the roasting commence. I allow it for <laughs> the next 15 seconds. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it, I am so excited to talk more about this project because it looks incredible. It looks like so much fun. Also, that little section um, in the middle there where you have the guy hopping back and forth over the lava screaming, ah, what have I done? I've never mm -hmm. related more to a character in my life, honestly. <laughs> yeah, the, the little mice are a bit helpless. It's, <laughs> it's, they struggle, but they do their best. Yeah, as we all do, you know? Yes. <laughs> I feel that Life in lessons my soul. in Flip Buckler. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, awesome. I, first of all, I would love to talk a little bit about what the inspiration was behind the game. Um, maybe your general overview of it. Uh, let us know what started all this. What do you think of it? So the whole game started um, around June in the, when the pandemic hit. I had a bit more free time. I was still working at the time, um, but I don't remember the, the the core moment like where I just decided to start working on it. But I, I realized like I really wanted to make a game, and something like like Paper Mario Thousand Year Door is a game I've been waiting for 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 years. Really, I was I was fourteen when that game came out, and sort of. Uh, continually a, a bit underwhelmed, I guess, by the Paper Mario games that were coming out after that, just because they they were deviating so strongly from the game I was expecting to play. And like, it, it just got to the point now where I was already a professional programmer I, and I could finally do something about it. So I, I got into Unreal because I was a C++ programmer and Unreal is C++ open source, which is key for figuring out really difficult problems. Um, so from then on, I just worked very slowly, uh, building up the, the game's engine over Unreal over time. And then eventually it got to the point where after I was sharing enough on Twitter, people seemed to really get what I was trying to do. Um, so I was inspired soon, soon after to, to go full time on the project and here we are now. That's awesome. So I love the idea that it was you had a game that you wanted to play and you couldn't find mm -hmm. it. So you decided to just make it. <laughs> I love that. I had no choice. I had no choice. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I just, it was because I could picture it in my head so clearly, like what they could do, that would be so much fun. And it just felt like a shame that there, there was nothing like that yet. So I was driven by that. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> make the game that you want so good yeah that's that's how it should be yeah absolutely so daniel when did you come into the picture then 
Yeah, so it was a little over a year ago. Um, I had seen like a snippet of the project on Twitter when I was just scrolling through, and instantly I was just like, kind of like hearing the music for it in my head at the time. I was just like full time uh, freelance musician, and I reached out to Ryan and wrote him like a little sample, and from there it was, yeah, it was just a great fit. Um, we very early on decided to do this kind of big band jazz style. Um, as we got talking more and more, um, as I said earlier, I just kind of got more involved in the project. Like I had these kind of um, game and level design skills that I were, were kind of working on on the side just as like a hobby for the past few years. Um, and I've always been really interested in it. And then um, it turned out Ryan needed a level designer. And so this past April, um, I just made a few levels and they they worked well. Ryan liked them. And yeah, from there, we just, I, I, went on this full time and it's been great since. That's awesome. <laughs> this really, it, so it sounds like this whole project really is kind of a full passion project for both of you from both ends, just starting up, you know, making the game that you wanted to play. And then Daniel, you finding something that you found inspiring mm -hmm. and just reaching out being like, hey, uh, I really want to be part of this. What do you think? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and it's, I, love I mean, I, I have to give a lot of credit to Unreal Engine for making it possible. Like it, it really, the tool really oh, is like amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Without it, there's pretty much no way it would have gotten this far this quickly. I can safely say that, so. That's the line well, I'm Tina really gave glad you, right? that these tools help. Yeah, well, yes, did I was. say it right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fantastic. Full marks. Uh, you can erase the pen off of your palm now. So <laughs> yeah, I'm really glad that these tools were able to help facilitate um, mm -hmm. both of you in making this project, especially because I really feel like this one in particular is very unique. I don't feel like we see too much um, 2D-esque games using Unreal very often, which is part of what really drew me to this project in particular. Um, so I was wondering if uh, you wouldn't mind talking a little bit about the decision. I, I know you talked about open source um, coding being a big part of why you were drawn to the engine, but what in particular made you decide that this was the, the right fit for your game? The, so I think one of the first things as well that drew me to the engine was that it was battle tested. Like there were so many good quality games that I knew were made with the engine. And I knew that the engine was also being developed at the same time as Fortnite, which tells me like if the engine developers are working on a game, as they develop the engine, they're solving real problems and they're implementing features that, that have like solid proof that these need to be in there to improve the engine. And I just, I trusted the development method of it and I had a lot of faith in the quality. And, That's yeah. awesome. And that plus the C++, as I mentioned, which was huge because I I tried other engines before, but the problem is as soon as there's an issue, if you don't have the source code, it's like you're just stuck and you have to hope that someone solved the issue online. And if not, yeah. then you have to, it gets a bit messy. Get to dive in and figure it out yourself. <laughs> mm. Just never the easiest or arguably the funnest either <laughs> self-made troubleshooting yeah it's just yeah i like being able to see all the putting breakpoints in there so i can like see immediately when something's wrong getting a breakpoint right in the engine itself is is crucial to so many like yeah. to getting to getting from 80 percent of the way done a feature to 100 percent, you really need that mm -hmm. all that control at least for me yeah yeah Totally understandable. What about you, Dana? Was this your first escapade into Unreal Engine for your composing, or were you familiar with the engine as well? I had never worked with the engine directly. Like I had worked with like middleware audio software like Wise and FMod and stuff, but this was my first time actually like opening Unreal and messing around with it. And yeah, I mean, I did find it very intuitive. Like not coming from a technical background, um, like I was able to open it up and create like my first level within like a day or two. Um, so like the learning curve wasn't too steep. And um, everything is just really like, everything's really visual, which I like. So it worked really well for me. 
Yeah, I fully agree. That is probably my favorite part of it too, is being able to, you know, there's a button that clearly displays what this button is going to do. And when I hit the button, it does the thing I expect it to do, which is very good for me and my simple one plus one equals two brainwaves. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm right there with you. Yeah. And I like that when I do break something, it's easy to fix. I just, I call up Ryan and it's immediately like, damn it, undone. Nothing, nothing's too destructive. It's nice. Mm -hmm. That's that's perfect. So I'm hearing, Ryan, that you also get to play IT from time to time as well. <laughs> it's fine. That's it's, it's probably the easiest part of the whole job. So I'm not going to complain about that. I'll, I'll mention that next time I have a problem, I'll mention you said that, that it was the easiest part of the job. <laughs> <laughs> it was like the softest. It's fine. <laughs> I think I've ever heard. <laughs> no, it, it really is compared to like animating and and creating the art style. Everything else is so much more tedious and more of an unknown to me than solving IT problems. So I'll I'll take those. It's it's a nice break, even sometimes. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And there are fewer and fewer problems as we as we keep working. Like I've I've learned this engine really quickly, and that's that's something I really love about it. Is like, just you you catch on so quickly. Like the ceiling is kind of infinite as far as like how much you can learn, but the floor of like getting in and making something is really low. So, yeah, yeah, definitely, awesome. Well, good. I'm glad that it's working out pretty well. <laughs> this would be really unfortunate if y'all came on here and you were like, it's terrible and awful and we've hated every second of it. <laughs> so I'm glad. I'm glad it's working out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so yeah, I know we were going to do things a little bit different today. And since you have your game here, I was wondering if we would like to jump right into it so we can give the viewers kind of a sneak peek of what y'all been working on. Yeah, cool. Um, I'll be playing and Ryan will be commenting. Before we start, I'd just like to mention that right now, as of two days ago, we are on Kickstarter. Um, so if anyone's interested, you can go over to our Kickstarter page and check it out and potentially pledge if you like to look at things, um, which basically means you can buy the game early to support development and uh, potentially get some cool rewards in the process. Like we have some unique costumes that are exclusive just to the campaign, as well as like get the soundtrack or, you know, um, unique Discord titles. So yeah, if you're interested, check that out. Okay. Yes, yes. I will jump over to the game window. Let me just have this turned down because I didn't want that blaring during the intro. <laughs> All right. So. Okay. Just to give us some context here of where we are, um, the plot in this book is that you play as Flint Buckler, who's this kind of like fairy tale character, and this evil corporation invades his storybook. They find a way to enter storybooks and like meddle with things. And so, in order to kind of save the day, he needs to go travel into other storybooks and like take down this company one peg at a time. Um, so, this demo jumps right into him entering the Three Little Pigs. And you'll see how the company has kind of messed things up there. Turn the story on its head. Okay, so there's a bit of lag here, like 10 seconds or so. So I might be talking kind of ahead of where of what you see on the stream. Um, okay. But yeah, basically, um, the two main segments of the game are kind of exploring the overworld, solving puzzles, and then there are like standard turn-based RPG battles, which you'll see in a second. Yeah, I, I can. Mm. I'll, 
I'll start talking after this battle. I think things will get... Okay, cool. Yeah, we'll get more into a flow. Okay, so that was a good overview of the two main systems of, of world movement and battle. I think one of the first things I can talk about just off the top of my head is the, the movement system. Um, so that's also a great a great uh, way to show the, the power of having it in C++ because... So all the characters... Of course, there's nothing like this type of character in Unreal Engine by default. Um, so all of the movement code was written by me um, in C++. Basically, took some inspiration from what was already there for, for capsule-based characters. Um, and had to re-implement a lot of the, the collision detection logic um, from scratch, essentially, in, in C++. Um, but it was totally worth it. Can I talk about? Okay, messed up by these unicorns here. These guys are my <laughs> favorite enemies. Yeah, the unicorns are angry for some reason. Um, I, I get it though. Push for that. I really wanted the unicorns <laughs> to be angry when Ryan was designing them. <laughs> was, yeah. Okay. Uh, unicorns. That's really my contribution choice. to the project. It's the angry unicorns. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're yeah, credited as right, angry unicorn guy. Yeah. <laughs> um, so actually, another feature, just looking around, the landscape tool was used very heavily in all of these areas. Basically, all of the terrain was built um, by Daniel with the landscape tool in Unreal. So it's all uh, painted. All those paths are painted on. Props are scattered on with the landscape tool. Um, it's kind of an interesting use case, I think. Maybe if you're only used to seeing these hyper-realistic Unreal Engine landscapes, um, we can show another use for them if you're interested in the more stylized type of art. Um, and uh, of course, all of the widgets were done in Unreal. All the fun animation is is um, yeah, made, made possible by the very powerful material editor in Unreal, which give, can give you some really satisfying animation relatively simply. Um, like the way the line bounces when you pick it up, things like that, they're really satisfying and, and pretty, pretty quick and easy to do in Unreal. That's awesome. Uh, Daniel, if you don't mind, uh, in just a moment here, let this go through. Sure. Yeah, I figure, um, yeah, once this cute little cutscene, there we go. Um, I want to make sure that we can have the viewers get the full experience. So if you don't mind staying right here for just a second, I have a couple questions that I'm going to throw at you in the meantime, and we'll see if we can figure out what's going on with uh, some of the artifacting and delay that we're seeing, because I want to make sure they can see how beautiful and amazing your project is because it's adorable and I'm already absolutely in love with it. Thank you. All right. So, yeah, we'll go ahead and pop back over to just the three of us for a moment here. Um, yeah, and there's already a couple questions from chat if you don't mind me tossing a few of those your way in the meantime. Sure. Yeah. So the the big question that I'm seeing several times, of course, is the style of the game. And they're wondering, obviously, I don't want to make you give up all of your tricks of the trade, but there are a couple questions surrounding that. And the first one I want to start with is, 
Um, obviously, you mentioned that you really enjoyed Paper Mario, but is that the main inspiration behind why you picked the style that you did? Or what's what's the story behind that? Um, so just to clarify by style, you mean like the, the 2D characters in a 3D world? Is that, is that the question? Yeah, yeah. Or um, just the, the visual style of the game in general. Uh, yeah, it was definitely Paper Mario inspired. That was uh, sort of one of the non-negotiable aspects of, of trying to make a game like this to me. It, it had to have that style. Like, I, I couldn't imagine it really being any other way. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, totally yeah, to understandable. Me it's, it's cool because it it really fits with like the storybook theme in general. Um, like to me, the worlds look like there's these like cartoon storybook characters that were plucked right from their right from their stories and placed onto this like open these open book landscapes, like these kind of um, diorama kind of kind of environments. Um, it's it's a really attractive look. Like I remember, like when I was first scrolling through Twitter, and like when this game caught my eye, it was it was just like the characters on the landscape. It was just so cool and so immediately inviting and warm and cute. Mm. I, yeah, I think it's one of the strongest elements of this project in my eyes. Yeah, it looks very friendly and like wholesome. I think is the best word I can think of. <laughs> For sure. Yeah, I guess, um, um, yeah, that's part of it, too, in terms of, like, the, I guess, more than just the 2D characters, but the, like, the character design as well. I want it to feel very, like, fun and vibrant and colorful. Not a game that took itself yeah. too seriously, just because that's that's the kind of stuff I, I guess I wanted to play. That's what I was in the mood for. Yeah. So, made it happen. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Um... Daniel, in the meantime, I don't know if you saw, we have a couple uh, tweaks for the stream that we can maybe try and make um, in the chat there for you. But uh, oh. yeah, the other question that I'm seeing is uh, they're wondering how much blueprint you utilized while making the game. Um, that's, a, that's a good question. So initially, I would say the first year it was very, very heavily C++ based. Like all of the core systems, like the movement and the battle system, are based like their foundation is C++ and then as mm -hmm. things went along and as I learned like more about the engine and the best way to use it with C++ there are some things that make sense to put in in blueprints um, it's hard to give an exact uh, percent maybe but I, I want to say like right right now at least most of the work that I do is blueprints like adding new mm. new features, um, like anything new that I need to add for battle at this point could be done in in blueprints the way I have it set up. Um, yeah. Like level scripting, things like that are all done in blueprints as well. Every once in a while, I need to jump back into C++ to support some new feature. It happens. It's always going to happen. But for now, I'm 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 pretty happy with the workflow that I was able to get set up. Yeah, absolutely. Uh... Is there any particular reason that you decided to go with blueprints? Uh, Speaking is hard sometimes. <laughs> it's, it's by far the, the fastest to iterate with. For a lot of things, it just doesn't make sense to do it in C++, even if I could, because it just it takes too long, and it's I'm not that mm. patient. <laughs> <laughs> Which is totally understandable. I think especially mm. when you have a very specific image in mind of how you want something to function, you just want it to function right away, right? It's the process of yeah. getting there is so tedious. <laughs> and it's also, if we ever want to have someone else on board who can work on new things in combat, new attacks, things like that, having that in a system that can be done primarily in Blueprints is really beneficial to that, so they don't need to know C++ if they're just doing gameplay programming. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, all right. I think we're looking smoother on our end. So if we want to hop back into the game, we can give that a go. All right. Let's see. Yeah, that's already better. Sorry, it's a delay. Awesome. Cool. <clears throat> all right. Another unicorn. 
Ryan, what um what inspired these characters, these enemies? What inspired them? So, yeah, I think that's a great question. I get that a lot. Um, I mean, we talked about the unicorn that was inspired by Daniel. You, um, the the vegetables. <laughs> I sort of just wanted like fun variety of characters. But when I think back to like why I thought of vegetables. I don't have it, like, I can't even say exactly why, but my gut is probably Banjo-Kazooie, actually. That, that game had, like, a whole set of vegetable enemies at the beginning, and I think that that imprinted on me somewhere. I played that game when I was, like, eight years old. That, I'm guessing that's, that's why I thought that's vegetables good. would be a, a reasonable enemy in a game. Who else would think that? Why? I love that. I was wondering if there was just like a particular aversion to vegetables as well or anything like that, but I like Banjo Kazooie as an answer. <laughs> and maybe Cuphead also made me, made me believe that vegetables could be evil. Because I love Cuphead. So actually, this dialogue system is also a good example of C++ being able to take you from 80% to 100% of the way. Um, there's a very subtle feature when you have text that displays one character at a time, and how that could interact with word wrapping. Um, so there, there's a point where I need to actually uh, go into C++ to make sure that it knows if the next word is going to be on the current line or the next line after the whole word is displayed. Otherwise, it kind of like transfers from the end of the line to the next line while it's scrolling through, which looks a bit janky. Um, so to, mm. to manage that whole system, I had to use C++ to get that, that last extra push. Um, so that's yeah, just another example of something I would not be able to do with that, that level of control, at least as easily as I was able to. Yeah. And it, it looks incredible. Um, I feel like the flow of it's very good. Do you want to um, fill us in on what's going on story-wise? I've been kind of blowing through the dialogue. Uh, the dialogue. So, as we said, this is the three little pigs. Um, however, they twist it up a little bit. And in this story, the three little pigs are actually evil. They're tearing the forest down from the peaceful wolves, trying to set up real estate and extract other resources oh, no. for the big corporation that hired them. So, oh I don't know if you were able to watch follow the, the dialogue as Daniel was scrolling through it, but basically right now, we're trying to get into their construction site to stop them. But we're not allowed in, because <laughs> we don't want them, of course. Oh, adorable! <laughs> Those wolf more characters irony. are. We love our irony. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if this is. A good comparison for me to draw for this either but um the combat and especially initializing the combat as well for some reason is giving me super intense pokemon vibes as well hmm. oh. it's turn-based like pokemon I yeah can see that I'm gonna avoid this guy not in the mood <laughs> yeah oh so you can just skirt around combat when you want to yeah, if you want to be to. honest, I will not play an RPG where battles are, like, forced. You need to be able to avoid them. Mm. Oh. See, I always forget about that one. And I've played through this demo <laughs> a million times. People like that guy. Um, oh, that's a good question. Someone's asking if it's possible to do a pacifist run. Oh, like Undertale? 
Yeah. Um, no, no, there's not, we have nothing planned like that. I think that's a fun <laughs> idea, but the idea of making the whole game compatible now without revealing anything. Yeah. Push our no, these these picks are evil. There's no, you can't negotiate with them. We gotta turn them into bacon. No. We're not, <laughs> we're not gonna eat any characters in the game. That's not the plan, but... <laughs> The only option yeah, is these um these wolves here are like really overly friendly, so they're just complete pushovers. And these pigs are coming through to like tear down their village, and they're like, "Uh, sure, I'll do the neighborly thing and let them buy." The wolves are very naive, and uh, yeah, they don't really understand. They take everything More at face sweet. value, except except one wolf. <laughs> Actually, after this, Daniel, do you want to show the out of balance system a little bit? Like when you jump in water, the recovery system? That Absolutely. was something that was, that's done in, in blueprints, actually. That's something where. I'm surprised oh. I haven't fallen in yet. Yeah. So, I, yeah, we have a nice system where basically you can set different points on the map um, that would be recovery points that when you fall in, it will find the closest one. Um, it's a really simple system to set up with blueprints. Um, there are some more complicated situations, like if you're going across a bridge and you fall off at the end, you don't want to respawn across the bridge, it's kind of like cheating. Like not how it's- you, you want to respawn at the beginning and have to re-cross it, like situations like that. So there, there are some more complications to the system, but it's, it's simplest, it, it, a very quick way to let you recover from out of bounds, and uh, yeah, that's, that's thanks to awesome. Blueprints. All right, well now we found the, uh, the wolf's co-workers that we're looking for to help us get into the construction site. Nice. Ryan, weren't these mice characters like some of the first you had in the game? Uh, that's true, yeah. The mice were, I think, the fourth models that I made. Uh, yeah, they weren't miners at the time, they were just mice, but... Yeah, um, I think at, at the time, the only level I had finished was the dungeon, and it just seemed clear that you need some mischievous mice running around a dungeon, so mm. they were added. <laughs> it's necessary, you know? It is, it is. Where am I going? I'm gonna heal real quick. Oh, Still gotta get the, the eye closing. Really are the sweetest. <laughs> yeah, his eyes don't close when oh, he sleeps. Yeah. He's, he's, I guess, demented in that way. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> These wolf models are too cute. They really are just sweet and naive, like you said. You want to go buy some stuff at the store? Oh, sure. I'll let him do his uh, business there. <laughs> I can give a, a production secret. The reason why he turns away, I don't know if I should reveal this, is because I didn't have time to animate the chomping, so we turned him away. So, honestly, so I love it. Dark secret of production. <laughs> It's, no, he's it's definitely easier a on you. Yeah. 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 It's easier on you, just... and I feel like thematically it fits just turning the camera away. No, please don't yeah, look. He's shy. Amazing. He's very shy. Yeah. <laughs> this is kind of a. We thought this would be like a fun gag where the troll takes all your coins and then after you defeat him you get your coins back but in pretty much every play test people are very upset when they give him all their coins um so i don't know if it if it's hitting the mark we want but we still think i mean they fun. have a choice 
they have a choice, it's true, but sometimes they don't, they just press A and then they realize what they did and they get really upset. Well, this helps. I gotta is know. <laughs> it's true, chat, this is a game I pose the question to you. I pose the question to you, chat. Would you pay all of your coins or would you be bad? <laughs> I must know. This is for research purposes, okay? It's important. I think the funny thing to me is also it's it's a demo at this point, and when people play through it, they understand it's a demo, and like they're gonna play it once and never come back to it most likely, but they still get really mm -hmm. upset when they it's like this instinctive reaction to losing all of something valuable. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Man, I'm getting trounced here. Yeah, this is our, our mini boss of the demo, the big boss. Um, well, I like that he takes yeah. care of the gnomes for me when he throws them at me. Yeah, he doesn't respect gnome nice life touch. at all. Yeah. <laughs> Seems the general consensus is never pay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what I would have picked if I was actually, like, playing through the full game. That's fair. Um, so we actually do have an you Easter egg with that. Um, no one has done this yet, it's very unlikely, but if you go to the troll with zero coins, we have a little secret cutscene and something funny happens. Um, I guess I could reveal it. But it's, it's yeah. silly. If you go, if you go with no coins, he pities you and he gives you like 50 coins. He feels sorry for you. So it's a little secret. Keep that in now mind. Spoilers. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is pretty much the end of the demo. We got one more little map here. Let's get to the end. Yeah, we do this guy. I guess one of the things that would be interesting to talk about is how I'm trying to design every enemy with some different ability. Like, this fight was extremely quick, but what he actually does is he emits, just like in the overworld, he's emitting these little guys um, that look, you might recognize them if you're familiar with Paper Mario. Um, they're sort of an homage to, yeah, something from that game. Um, but this, the, the volcano we just saw emits these guys during combat. Um, and like other enemies will do different things. Some enemies will dodge your attacks, some will guard your attacks. Um, some of them can do damage if you attack them a certain way. I, I try to have every enemy add something a little bit different than every other. And that's also, um, so that that's features a bit more complicated in some cases. Um, like there's an enemy that's not in the demo that will counter attack you instantly. If you attack him, he shoots you back. Um, so systems like that require like going into C++ to revamp the battle system a bit. It's changing the way the battle flows. But other other systems I'm able to get in just in blueprints. Um, but it's ultimately yeah, having having the ability to be that flexible is is really crucial to getting everything I want in the battle system. Uh oh. Yeah. Something happened. Oh no. Well, this is literally the end of the demo. Like yeah, they're the about to run in the cave. Okay, that works out oh. then. I do love the little bit there about a uh, gotta support small businesses, you know, gotta pay the toll to the troll. <laughs> right, right, exactly. So everyone in chat who said never pay, think about that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, the, the troll is just trying to make a living for his his kids. Yeah, he's just having a bad day. Not the guilt trip you were expecting. <laughs> so Ryan, you want to open up Unreal and show what's underneath the hood, so to speak? Um, I could do that soon. Are there any questions from anyone? Um, there's a couple questions, although let me see. Some of them might be better if we kind of group them together at the end. I think it could be really fun if we we dive in and kind of have the immediate follow-up to that fun demo we just saw. Okay. Okay. Um. 
All right. So is my stream going? Yep. Cool. Um, so this is what the game looks like in editor. Um, this is one of the maps in the demo. So I can give it a brief tour. Um, I think the landscape and all the visual elements must look like you'd expect. You probably see all these boxes. Um, so these are all the stuff that if you're not familiar with game development. Um, you wouldn't realize they're there, but there's all sorts of checks that need to be done for the camera to make sure that it's in the right place at the right time. Um, for example, mm -hmm. so it doesn't cut off if it runs to the left, um, so that it stops at the right point. So these volumes are all necessary to be set up. And they're also an example of another system that's a combination of C++ and Blueprints, where the, the core of it is in C++, the actual logic of um, like the whole camera system actually is C++. But then there are certain Blueprint hooks to make it easy to control with, with Blueprints. And then from there, it's easy to tie that into a volume that can check uh, like if Flint is, is overlapping with it to do something to the camera. Um, this little volume here is the out of bounds volume that I mentioned before, where you can, if you jump into the water, this is what you overlap with to detect if you've fallen out. And then you can see these two points here that you will, re you will recover to. Um, and it's super easy to just sure. add new points if I want um, anywhere, and it will just find the closest one. Uh, moving on. Um, oh, well. So this is a little a little butterfly that's animated along a spline component. Um, again, with Unreal, it's really it's really nice and easy to set these kinds of things up to get some really. Um, I do simulate. I don't do this quite a lot. Okay. So you can see this is what you get with that. Um, yeah. I yeah, love that. It's, it's a very simple way to add some extra life to the level. Exactly. Exactly. It's. It, I, I find in Unreal like anything like that, where you're like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if like this thing moved a little bit? These little touches that go a really long way. It's. It's really easy to do that. I'm really happy. Um, what else? Any other volumes? I'm always forgetting to place down camera volumes. Like the bane of my yeah. <laughs> The necessary evil for us. Um, right. What other volumes? Okay, these are blocking volumes. Again, for people not familiar with game dev, sometimes you have to just cut sections off of the level that players will otherwise exploit. So. We have volumes placed around to keep players doing what they're supposed to. Although there are instances still of always find people getting around that. There, there are a few yeah. Yeah, secret bugs right now. But yeah. <laughs> There's always a couple. Yeah. yeah. Um... Yeah, it's like half the time is spent building the level. The other half is like placing the volumes, setting up the blocking volumes to like serve as like a boundary to the level to make sure no one's like climbing up places they shouldn't. So mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. a lot of work just goes into like kind of just like putting down the, the volumes that no one notices are there. Or like if they're doing their job correctly, no one no one sees them. There's always some people that yeah. try to get around them. I always I, I've seen some people try some things. Um, some are successful. But that, that is a, a huge part of it, for sure. Um, I was about to ask, how often do you get um, players who are specifically trying to break your game <laughs> by just jumping in places they're not supposed to be or, you know, things like that? Um, it's interesting. In the playtests we've done, I don't tell them to, but some players just have this instinct where they, they try to break the game for some reason. I don't know where it comes from. It's like they think... It's like they see it as a challenge almost that they know the game's not finished, and all right. they're trying to point out all the all the issues with it. Um, and yeah, they're successful sometimes, so it's actually beneficial to us when they do. Right. Yeah. Do you have one in particular that was um, like a, a very interesting way that they managed to break your game? Oh, 
Yes. Um, one player in particular found a whole bunch of bugs, a friend of mine. Um, there's a <laughs> there's an exploit that you can use to skip like a decent chunk of cutscenes. Um, using the buckler with the, the landscape tool, there's a collision bug where you can sort of climb up walls you're not supposed to. Um, so that that's that's high on our to do list right now uh, to fix. That's probably able to do that as well. Um, I think so. I'm on my keyboard now. It's a bit tricky to do. Um, let me see. I was messing around with it and could not could not replicate it. Let me see. Uh, so you really have to try for it. Maybe you should leave it in because then it's a challenge. <laughs> Right, for like speed it's the, runners it's the kind stuff. of thing that speedrunners will absolutely exploit if we left it in. It's like textbook speedrunner <laughs> bug. Um, let's see if I can get it. Yeah. Oh. No. I'm on my keyboard, so it's tricky. There you go. So you're not supposed to be able to skip that like that. I don't know if you just saw what I did, but I jumped. You're not supposed to be able to jump over this ledge, but with the buckler, it's quite easy. Um, right. <laughs> so yeah, things like that. Speedrunners will love it, but unfortunately, we probably have to patch that soon. Oh, that's sad. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if people in chat have an opinion about bugs like that, if we should leave them in, or... Not my gut is oh, to yeah. take them out as a developer. <laughs> no, we love people skipping through the levels I painstakingly created. <laughs> I just love it. Feels great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just skip all of that hard work and time that you've put into it. Yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> Ryan, do you want to show us what like some of the most complicated blueprints look like for like maybe some of the cutscenes? I always think that's really interesting. Um, let me show a little bit, I I guess. At a high level. I don't know yeah, how much sense sure. it'll make, but it will show at least like how blueprint helps structure cutscenes. Um Okay. So this would, would be the level. Yeah. Um, so I mean, this is the example of when the wolf bites the, um, the vines. This is the first cutscene here. So you can see I have all sorts of nodes for convenience, like setting the cutscene which along with setting the letterbox um, on the top and bottom, it also, like, you can have a custom sound play, a custom uh, background track. It also takes care of managing a whole bunch of state behind the scenes that are required for other systems to interact well with the, the cutscene system. Um, and then play dialogue, which is, this is like the tip of the iceberg of play dialogue, where I tried to make it as convenient as possible, but also as um, full of, of feature as possible, so you can control the text, who's speaking, and some other things as well. Uh, there's a lot more dials and knobs that it's hiding, but for cutscenes, this is useful, I would say, like 95% of the time, if you just want a character to speak. Um, and then this is all the camera control stuff. So if you remember the cutscene where he turns away and then the camera shakes a little bit, um, these are convenience nodes for turning the camera away. Um, pauses with the delay, shaking the camera and playing the sound as he bites it with delay. Um, and then destroying the ferns off screen, of course, so you don't see them just vanish into nothing. Um, and then set the feedback camera, he talks. Again, the next part. And then I have convenience notes for moving characters around, like moving the character to uh, to the certain position in the tunnel and then destroying himself um, and then setting the cutscene off and then it's it's done and that's simple cutscene um, 
I think if I go to more complicated cutscenes, it would be similar stuff, just more nodes, um, more logic to sequence. Um, and I, I will say I know like I've seen some add-ons that are maybe supposed to help with cutscenes. I've never been convinced that there's a better way to do it than making custom nodes um, with C++ and, and Blueprints myself. So I will say that I really value that control that Unreal gives me to give me like the, the optimal solution for my needs to be able to make these kinds of tools and give me that flexibility. It's, it's another reason why I'm able to get the game to the state it's at. Um, and what I think is, is a, a, a relatively short amount of time. Yeah. Yeah. I must admit, I think these are some of the cleanest blueprints that have ever been on the show. Ever. Oh, wow. I, I was going to apologize <laughs> that, they're, that they're messy. <laughs> I, no, I mean, I just is... try to keep them in sequence so that like I could follow along if I need to make a change. But I try to condense yeah, like all the logic great. I can into nodes. Factor, refactor as much as I can when I need to. <laughs> yeah, very it's organized. very, very streamlined. Yeah. That's, that's when I'm, whenever I'm screen sharing and I'm like making a blueprint in front of Ryan and I like put something like that's like overlapping, he'll be like, you can just see it on his face. Like, you know, you should, you should, you could always just put it above neatly. <laughs> I've learned. Oh, actually, I, yeah, I do have an add-on for the, the node connectors. If people are wondering how they're like at nice angles instead of the more smooth angles or smooth curves that you get by default, I do have an add-on for that, which I love. Um, I don't remember what it's called, though. So I can look into that if people are interested. Oh, I, I just had the name of it in my brain and it's lost i'll find it and we'll we'll drop it in chat because it's i know it's lots cute. of people enjoy it costs money but it's like yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. i don't know i'm a fan of the spaghetti myself but i feel like i'm also biased in this case so <laughs> i feel i feel like there's a lot of value that goes to like psychological comfort when you're a programmer you're developing a complicated system that when you when you jump into the base, if you feel comfortable and you don't feel like things are messy and overwhelmed, it actually boosts productivity. Like even though, regardless of whether or not that that organization is connected to your productivity, just the fact that it puts you in a better mood it makes you more productive. I just noticed. Mm. Like it just make it's just less stress. It's just every if you feel like you're more in control. Maybe it could easily just be just be me, but I see a lot of value to things like that. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm curious about you then, Daniel, since you're more on the artistic side. Do you feel the same way or are you more on the uh, give me chaos, I thrive here kind of side of the spectrum? <laughs> it's not so much like give me chaos. It's just it kind of just happens like I <laughs> it spirals and I, <laughs> I can't control it. Um, I, I'll like I'll never show anyone one of my like logic sessions for, for music because it's just an absolute mess. and. <laughs> kind of embarrassing but um definitely like with the blueprints um and that uh add-on that ryan has like it's very easy for me to just like okay i can just line this up and move on and it's fine um in general like the blueprint system is something that like it has been really easy for me to use as like a non-technical person i like don't really know how to code um but you know ryan's created all these nodes and i can just like line them up and connect the dots and it's like it's so intuitive um yeah. so i i would i would say that blueprints have never really spiraled into chaos um just by the nature of their design they're just like i guess i haven't yeah. seen some of the examples you're talking about the spaghetti examples but uh in my experience they're pretty they're pretty easy to control if i showed some of the other there are some blueprints i'm thinking of that are a good amount messy or some of the more complicated attacks um so i don't have to show those um they're it, just because of the way the logic flows, it's a bit messier. I do my best. Mm -hmm. I think they're not bad, but they're, yeah, like what I just showed is probably <laughs> like as clean as it can get. Because it's it, a cutscene mm -hmm. is fairly straightforward. Like typically there's no branching, maybe a little bit at the beginning, the way we have it set up, but yeah. Um, yeah. Those mm -hmm. ones don't bring quite as much joy than your cutscene ones, I'm hearing. <laughs> I'm happy with them, to be honest, compared to what they could be. 
Um, I'm happy with how clean I'm able to get them because it's, you just, yeah, like the, the goal is just to make, put things in a state where if I need to jump in, I'm not like regretting all my choices. If I have to go back in, in a month and I, I have to say like, right. I'm, that's, I'm, I'm never really lost when I jump back into something that I made in blueprints. Um, I think that's like the help of the add-ons and like, there's so many tools in blueprints that help you keep things organized if you want to use them. So yeah, I try to jump on those so that I don't feel like things are going off the rail. Um, yeah, yeah, certainly. Is there a lot of um, back and forth between the blueprint set setups that both of you have made? Like, for example, uh, Daniel, do you end up finding yourself going into Ryan's blueprints very often or vice versa? Or do you tend to kind of keep your elements mostly separated? Yeah, um, actually, like sometimes if I need to like tweak something, like if I have recording footage and I need the, you know, an enemy to attack harder or have more defense or whatever, like I can open up Ryan's blueprints. And even though it's like this crazy web of stuff that I have no idea, I have no idea what's going on, I can always find like the one thing that like, okay, this changes the enemy's health and I can go in and just like tweak it. Or like, you know, if he has this crazy system, I can, I can pretty easily, even if I don't understand on like a macro level what's going on, I can go in and just change the one value that I need to make the adjustment. Yeah, that's one of like the goals too, and something that blueprints help with is just keeping things like as simple as they need to be. So like if there's if it should be like one thing that controls one other thing that you'd look for, um, I want it to to reflect that in in the blueprint code itself. It's important. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that was. Sorry to go on a whole blueprint tangent there. It's one of my favorite things ever is seeing mm -hmm. the different ways that people use them and organize them, especially. It's a, an interesting little... It's like um, a personality test, maybe. It kind of is. It kind mm -hmm. of is. I feel like I can tell a lot about a person by their blueprints. <laughs> oh, God. If you think I'm organized, you'd be wrong, though. If you saw my desk right now, um, yeah, my fiance, she complains constantly that I need to clean this desk up. So I, I sort of prioritize what's what's clean, what's not in my life. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's fair. That's fair. I guess the other thing, it would be, what do your blueprints look like? And how many tabs do you have open at any given time? Mm -hmm. I'm seeing Tab the wise. look around on Daniel for a second there. And I, I don't know if I hit a sore spot or not with that one. <laughs> Um, I, I'll no, yeah, I'm. Go, first. go ahead, Brian. I, I was just gonna say, I think <laughs> tab wise, I I have a comfortable like screen screen width of tabs, but it's not like to the point where they're like a millimeter long each, like comfortably full. I'll say that. <laughs> I don't even know if you can call mine tabs. They're just like little tiny slivers that <laughs> it's just. Uh, They're so up like, there forever okay. and they never get closed. Yeah. 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 It's like yeah. ancient history. Are you kind of guessing? Better left you go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I need to be better about that. Well, whatever works for you. I can you, still find what I need. Say. Yeah. Eventually you What's learn. Like, say it works it's... for me. Oh. Yeah. It's, it does good. the job, though. No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, you know, and it's um, I didn't mean to to dredge up <laughs> the the debate on tabs, but I get that. I I can't oh, I can't say anything because I'm the same way. It's either, <laughs> except I feel like it's almost worse because I'll get to the point where I realize that there are too many tabs open, so instead of just closing tabs maybe or bookmarking stuff i know i might need to go back to later i just pull my current tab out into a separate window and then let that one that also too. collect tabs over time <laughs> yeah you're speaking my language i thought you were going to say that when you get too many tabs you just close the whole chrome window and just it's too overwhelming you just destroy them all at once Sometimes oh I, no, I can understand no. that. You could never do that. I can understand what that. If you, what if you need one of your tabs from three weeks ago? So I do a so quick exactly. scan at all no the tabs, way. and I judge if I can delete them all. If so, then the window's dead. I have to kill it. 
or it's 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 too oh messy. <laughs> This it gets is, too personal for me. I don't I know if I could ever commit like that. Yeah. <laughs> These tabs have been with you through so much. How can you abandon them, you know? <laughs> right. It's right. true. Yeah. <laughs> you see, like, but DoorDash orders in... made, like, four months ago. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, we can get back on topic. <laughs> I would love to uh, to dive back into the engine since you had the scene pulled mm -hmm. up there. And if you don't mind, we can kind of fly through and maybe you can describe um, almost kind of like the same thing as the demo that you were just doing, but then seeing it from the engine perspective of it, if you don't mind. Um, sure. I mean, I don't know exactly here you can see more secrets and out of bound areas. Um, I can talk a, a can little you, maybe about. Do you mean? Um, yeah. You are you saying going through kind of sequentially? Oh, do you want me to go yeah, through kind every, of, but, yeah? Uh, yeah, I thought there might be maybe some little um, bits of stories here and there from when you were setting the level up or a certain bug in this one sure. spot that you had to work on, you know, things like that. Sure. Um, oh, well, I can, this reminded me of another system, this whole camera rig that we have set up for the cutscene is made very possible by the camera rig actor in Unreal. Um, so yeah, getting that figured out, it's really nice to have like these nice overviews of areas. Um, and this is an extremely quick way to do that um, for a cutscene. It's a bit of extra work to interact with my camera system. Um, this is like different, different parameters and, and different restraints to each one. Um, but yeah, having it work, yeah, it's great. And then you start the cutscene, and uh, yeah, game starts. Um, Yeah, I, I don't know if you have any thoughts, Daniel, when you see this. Any funny stories setting this one up? Anything? Um, I mean, nothing too exciting. Like, I remember we we spent a lot of time trying to figure out how we were going to do the like outdoor areas. This was the first. This map actually was the very first outdoor area we made, um, mm -hmm. and the very first time we used the landscape tool, um, because before it was, it was all like interior levels. And so, like, we spent so much time getting the lighting right, and um, I, you know, and once once we figured out we're about copy and paste between levels, but it was like a lot of just like tweaking and everything to just get it to look exactly how we wanted to. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. That also reminds me of just all the features, like all the the world settings for baking, lighting. They're all really powerful and and yeah, fairly simple too for what the control they give you. So like figuring out how to get the light settings right, uh, combined with all like the lights in the scene. Uh, but you get really good res results with Unreal like pretty quickly, more more so than I've seen in in other engines for the the amount of time we had to spend doing it. Which, yeah, yeah. Some iteration for a while. I hadn't. It was reasonable. For a while, I hadn't been baking any of the lighting uh, when I was first kind of learning, and I was just making the levels and like adjusting on the fly. And so by the time I finally sent them to Ryan and we like baked them, they were like so bright, like everything just turned like white, yeah. blinding. Bake, bake your lighting, <laughs> kids. Don't don't yeah. put that off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um. um. You know, it would be kind of cool is maybe like you open up one of the enemy blueprints and just kind of show like the animation and like what it what it looks like in there. And I always think those are really um, cool. Suppose you show something. I vote the unicorn. Well, too late. Oh, no, this one's good. Too. We're going. We're going with a creepy cultist. Oh. So this is just. This is one of our Lovecraft-inspired characters. Um, oh, man. You can get a little bit of a sense of, like, what goes into one character, really. All of these components, um, some of them are the mesh, other of them are just 
uh, scene components that need to be there to mark different positions on the character for different reasons. Um, there's the animation in the every character has an animation blueprint, of course, to manage all the different states. Um, yeah, and this is probably one of the more simple characters. Um, but you can see it, it's still a lot goes into just one of them. You tr I try to streamline as much as possible. Um, and like, it's pretty quick to make new characters. I have to say, mm -hmm. like, that's there's a whole. Uh, I mean, people might be curious about like the character art in general, and that's really like that's even beyond Unreal Engine to get the character art um, into the engine. It's a whole like pipeline I've set up between a, a bunch of different applications. Um, that lets me do it pretty quickly, but it's credits to Unreal for like being adaptable in that sense to let me do it. Yeah. Um, um, What's the first thing you do when you bring in a character into Unreal for the first time? The first thing I do is... I don't know if this is... I, I've never seen you do this, so I'm genuinely interested. Oh. I have to import the components. Like the mesh and the, the mesh, the animations, the textures from the textures, I have to create the materials. Um, and then there's a whole system in place. Um, for, so for characters that can cycle through different expressions, for example, um, there's a whole system that ties into the animation um, and the mesh itself for, for having like displaying the correct expressions at the right time. So I have to connect with that one. Um, what else? Yeah, like you can see in the folder, these are basically this is like the bare minimum for a character is these categories of things. Um, and and this is minus all of like the um, like the logic that's implemented in, in the blueprint itself. Mm -hmm. um, like there's more there's more. Like data associated with that character that's in here. Um, yeah. Like what attacks they have. Um, their attributes, their health, things like that. I think the, the one thing that I'm really appreciating, especially seeing the actual process that you go through for a lot of this like character being brought in included is it's all simplified down to exactly what it needs to be i'm not seeing a ton of extra unnecessary fluff that just kind of convolutes the process it's all exactly this is what needs to get done this is the way it needs to be implemented yeah. this is where it needs to be placed and then it's done which must I, make I think that's much a, easier with just the two of you. Well, that's that's something like I really that's something that came with experience in programming. So I I didn't say yet, but I so I worked in as a professional programmer in in investment banking, and in at an animation studio before, and you you just learn the value of keeping things as simple as they need to be and removing fluff. So like how that translates to Unreal as well is I know there's. I sort of touched on this before, but there's a lot of plugins that can promise to solve all kinds of problems. Um, but I would say, like, I'll speak for myself. They always have more than I actually want. And I just know adding them into the project would create way more of a headache um, in the long run. And that's if they actually solve the problem in the end, which, I mean, they usually don't. The more they promise to do, the less likely they are to solve the problem for me. Um, usually, like the very simple add-ons are the one I'll go with, like the node lines or something that do one thing and do that well. That's that's what I'll always uh, prefer. Um, but yeah, it's yeah, reducing fluff is a great way to keep the project healthy and yeah, you're yourself sort of just happy working on the project. It's something yeah, they don't really teach in school. Work. I don't want to get into a rant against like object-oriented programming that's been done a million times, but <laughs> yeah, they don't really teach you the cost of like creating a million classes everywhere and creating all these complicated hierarchies and just the weight that it has and the, the complexity it adds to a project. Um, mm -hmm. So that's 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 a lesson that I definitely learned uh, working before I started this game. Yeah, valuable one too, for sure. 
for sure. Yeah. Awesome. Well, we have so many questions from chat. Like I'm looking at the list here and it's pretty long. So if the two of you don't mind, I would love to dive into some of these. Let's do it. Yep. Sure. Awesome. So the first one, this actually works out pretty well based off of what you were just talking about too, um, from Sir Voxelot, which awesome name, by the way, <laughs> really love that one. Uh, do you guys use any cool plugins to make the game or just build everything from scratch? Yeah, so I can look through my plugins now. Um... Off the top of my head, I don't think I use any anything very big um, mm. at all. Let me check. Mostly those very simple okay. but effective I ones have, you're talking I have, about. I have three. There's three plugins, and I think just two that I actually use. There's the so that that node plugin was called Electronic Nodes, um, and the other is Low Entry Extended Standard Library, which is like a a blueprint extension to the base blueprints that just has a, a whole bunch of convenience uh, functions that came in handy. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, both of those are very specific, like you were just saying. <laughs> yeah, like I, as I explained, is just what I what I think works actually works and makes the projects better. Is keeping it simple and specific. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Turning Cog was wondering, uh, for the game itself, is there a companion system where you can get different friends for the journey as well? Uh, yeah, absolutely. There's, in in the demo uh, Daniel played, so you saw there was that like big white guy, big puffy, people call him a marshmallow. He's more, he's really a doll, but no one really sees that all the time. Um, yeah, he's he's an example of one companion. We have, if you watch uh, our Kickstarter trailer, we have our dragon companion, uh, we have a witch companion, and uh, some other companions too. That's awesome. So lots of friends to collect. <laughs> of course, that that's also, so getting back to like um, Paper Mario inspiration, one of the things that they've deviated from was this partner system. I imagine that's why the question's being asked is because it's something fans have been waiting for since 2004 so that was also a non-negotiable thing for me to include yeah i love that some friends we need them course, yeah. <laughs> it also makes fighting so much easier when you have another body there with you you know yeah, the, the power <laughs> of friendship of course yes really. yes it's just fun like nobody likes just mario i mean maybe that's controversial but we want we want all of his colorful friends with him too yeah, we need that. <laughs> those, are the, those are the real favorites. Mm -hmm. Yeah, strong stance <laughs> we're taking here. You're going to get roasted yeah. on Twitter after this, just so you know. Yeah, let's, let's edit that part out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll cut it. We'll cut it in post. Don't worry. <laughs> cool, cool. Um, Thomas Franklin is wondering, did you use paper to Z or paper ZD or some other means for making your characters? And I know this is one of those um, things that you're like, the secret well, sauce. So it's up to you so how much just, you want to explain. With with that question, you could probably guess the answer is no, I use my own system. If uh yeah. I can say that. I, I have never even yeah, tried those those I think I've heard of them before, but I from what I understand, they're not, they don't really, um, really work the way that I need them to work. I haven't, mm -hmm. again, I haven't, maybe they are feasible for what I'm doing, um, but yeah, I didn't really look into it even. Yeah. You've got your own secret, TM. <laughs> <laughs> Flint Buckler trade secrets, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, another question from Sir Voxelot is, are you guys using spine to animate a lot or is it mostly custom bone rigs? I know that we saw the spine for the butterfly, obviously that was flo floating around, but uh, mm -hmm. do you use it for anything other than that? 
uh, the spine. No, just I I would use it in the future if I needed to animate something like a spine. But if he's referring to the characters, um, it's all every character has a custom rig. There's, it's yeah, that's out of Unreal Engine. Yeah, awesome. Uh, Cinnamon Wolf was wondering how difficult slash easy did y'all find setting up the lighting for the game, especially since it's so stylized. It seems to be something a lot of people struggle with is finding the right balance for a very colorful game without totally blowing it out on accident by not baking. <laughs> I, I, know I totally struggle with the lighting. I, I honestly like yeah. lighting for me is like the hardest part of level design because it like just the slightest change will will completely alter the player's perception of the level. So we do spend a lot of time like kind of choosing a color palette and then it's like, you know, it can be days of like going back and forth and like, you know, we we just made this new level that's kind of this like seaside town at night and we're just like experimenting different shades of blue. Like we know it wants to be blue. Or we, we we need it to be blue, but we don't know what shade, and it's like just tweaking that, tweaking the fog, tweaking the the brightness of it all. Um, yeah, I I would say it's very challenging. I mean, Unreal makes it pretty easy um, to just like go back and forth and try a bunch of different things, but from like an artistic standpoint, it's it's very tricky to pick the right. Uh, I I just want to add too. There's this is something I I haven't seen spoken about in getting like lighting right for games, but so I also just have an interest in, in art. I'm not a great artist, but I liked watching like videos on art. And like, basically, if you, if you like take a, or watch a lesson on composition, you learn how to make a, like, a painting look good. But all of those fundamentals apply just as well to building an appealing looking level. Like there's, like there's certain things you want to make sure, like you want to have shapes visible. You want to have apparent contrast between different elements. Um, you want to make sure that like, the form is apparent of an object. There's all these little fundamentals that translate basically one to one um, when you're designing like a nice aesthetic. So it's it's worth it if you have time to check out something that might not seem valuable at all, but like a painting composition course could teach you a lot. And uh, if it's something that anyone's interested in, yeah. That's so true. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. I completely agree. I feel like learning the fundamentals <laughs> behind mm -hmm. a lot of these concepts really aids in the end result and even just the creation yeah. process itself. Yeah, it's it's key, key stuff. Yes, for sure. This is a soapbox I could be on for the rest of today. So I'm going to personally move on before I continue this forever and ever. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Zeminus is wondering, the art style is so unique, which I also agree with. It's very unique and beautiful. Um, environment wise, how did you confidently keep a balance of basic textures and models while still ensuring the quality of the environment? Um, that's a good question. And my, my honest answer is, I know in my head sort of what the right balance is and you just kind of try things like you put it put it out there like i think this this is what i'm looking for you don't really know until you just put it put it in the level and then you have to react to what you get um like you're hopefully guided by something in your head some intuition or some vision but there's nothing beats actually just doing it and making all those mistakes and reacting to them it's just you're not going to get good results um other, otherwise. Yeah. Just do it. Exactly. <laughs> Just try Just it, it out. Yeah. <laughs> um, to quote our far too old meme at this point now, I guess. Is... <sighs> It's sad when I, when I say just yeah. do it. Yeah, it's sad when I talk about it and then people don't know what I'm referencing. And I'm like, is this... It'd be Nike that you're referencing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I guess that's true. Who knows? <laughs> I'm unhip. I'm not in the hip anymore. <laughs> um, Harold Sweat is wondering, were there any unique problems that came out of having 2D-ish characters that live and interact with a 3D world? Um, yeah, I think the biggest one 
is the the collision issue. Like I so I mentioned before, having to read or construct the the character collision and movement system from scratch was probably the the biggest hurdle to overcome in getting uh, this 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 aesthetic in the game. I mean, that was like when I started working on the game. Uh, movement system was yeah, that was actually like the number one thing that I figured out first before anything else. It was at the point where I had just like a little like disc in 3D that would just move around and that I could see which way it was oriented and I could make sure it was colliding properly with the environment. Um, but yeah, by far that's that's the biggest hurdle. Yeah, absolutely. What about you, Daniel? Did you have any uh, particular difficulties with the 2D-ish characters in a 3D world? Um, from a level design perspective, it's a little bit tricky because um, you kind of have to treat the level like, I mean, because we have that fixed camera and or for the most part from like one angle. And so you kind of have to treat it like you're designing like a 2D, like top down kind of level as far as like how the player is going to be navigating it. Um, and, you know, it can make it, it, you know, if you do it the wrong way, it might be kind of just like confusing visually to like, like, oh, where can I take this character? right because they occupy a 2d plane you need to be able to understand exactly like where you can walk and where they can fit into so um yeah it's definitely tricky but the effect when it's pulled off is is really worth it i mean i personally just think it's such a cool look yeah absolutely i fully agree it's like <laughs> it is one of the cutest um most visually interesting games i've seen in a while and I keep wanting to use the word wholesome, but it's, <laughs> we're also seeing cultists and witches mm -hmm. and, you know, so it's, maybe yeah, wholesome we, isn't we the right word debate. here. But... We've had the same <laughs> debate between, yeah, me and Daniel, like, how wholesome is this game actually? Um, yeah, there, <laughs> I think there the is violence. Cute. They're cute. There is a, a giant duck with a, a butcher knife cleaver, so who knows? There's some give and take he's here. Cute. <laughs> he's you know, ultimately all the characters are still cute. It doesn't matter if they're trying to trying to butcher you or murder you or whatever. It's a, it's an acute yeah. package and that's what matters. That's what makes it wholesome. Yeah. <laughs> and there's no blood or anything. Is it? Maybe maybe we'll have like a gore patch or something if people want it. Where oh, all of a sudden no. like heads are flying <laughs> off and like guts and <laughs> oh, no. Uh, but it can't be for the whole thing, right? You have to go through a couple levels with it just being normal, and then all of a sudden it just enables, yeah. and everyone is very lost and confused. It's like all of a sudden you right, jump yeah. out of the book and you're in the real world with real world consequences to violence. So there you go. It writes itself. Oh, Sequel. this is horrifying, and I love it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, let's see. There's a couple of these questions that you actually kind of answered just naturally through uh, walking through some of the levels. Like there were uh, quite a few questions about the recovery points. Um, the one that I guess hasn't been answered yes, yet technically, was there any particular reasoning for the spots that you do have the recovery points at? Um, like for example, I know there's some games where obviously if you fall into a river, then you go all the way back to the beginning. Um, and it seemed like you wanted to make a point of not necessarily punishing the player too much for maybe slipping and falling off and still staying in the same general area. Absolutely, yeah. That's that's something I thought about a lot. It's there will be cases where it, it makes sense to punish the player. Like if if the puzzle, if the challenge is to to, to traverse an area, then it makes sense that if they fail that challenge and fall off, they go to the beginning. But for just like moment to moment, moment gameplay, I just didn't see a good justification to lose all your progress because you like you misjudged the jump. It's not it's not really the point of the game to me. So I was like, I just when I play games like that where it's like the platforming isn't the the main appeal. I don't like being punished for making those kinds of mistakes. So mm -hmm. it's really just yeah my own my own philosophy on that that's informing that. That's fair. Yeah. You didn't want to make a rage game, is what I'm hearing. Exactly. <laughs> not rage. If there's going to be rage, it'll be because I designed for it to be there, not because they're like they miss a jump or something silly. 
Uh, let's see. There's a lot of really good questions and I'm trying to <laughs> parcel through because we actually ended up getting quite a few, especially um, through the demo and stuff. Quite a few have popped up here. Um, if either of you have previously developed for realism maps or anything less stylized than what this currently is, do you, how does it differ in the design aspects of designing the flow for a stylized map? And what do you look out for? I used to do um, modding for this older horror game, Amnesia of the Dark Descent. Could not be more different from this, but that's like where I kind of started. I, I used to mess around with that in like high school and stuff and uh, early college. And yeah, I mean, it is totally different. Um, because in this game, it's like, it's all about presentation. Like, I feel like every time you stop moving and you take a screenshot, it has to look like absolutely gorgeous, like an open pop-up pop book. Whereas with like a realistic environment, you're not necessarily so concerned with like, I mean, it has to look pretty, but you're more concerned with like making people feel like immersed, like they're really, they're really there, especially if it's like a first person okay. camera. Um, so. I mean, yeah, very different sets of challenges for sure. Yeah, I never even thought of that, but that's a really good way of putting it where every single possible frame has to be basically screenshotable. <laughs> like you said, like you could put it yeah. right into a book. That yeah, I, I think especially a game with like a fixed camera like this, um, that's really important. Like I know that's like a general philosophy for a lot of level designers. Like every every single view of the game needs to be screenshotable. Um, I don't think that's as true for like a first person game with like you know realistic graphics because that's you know like the player can go and they can look up at the sky or look down at the ground and whatever. And it's like you don't have control over that. But with this, it's like every every frame of it is like it's really important. That's what that's what sells the the feel and the aesthetic. Yeah, absolutely. I <laughs> I am now going through the whole process of that in my own head because that just sounds like such a challenge in and of itself, <laughs> truly, of making sure that every single part of this is absolutely beautiful. And, oh, man, that has to take so much time <laughs> in and of itself. It does, but you get a you get a feel for it after a while. Like you kind of come up with your own um, your own pipeline for like making levels, and um, you just kind of feel out the pacing. And you, I, I don't know, when I build levels, I'm just kind of in a zone, so it's not like tedious. Like oh, I gotta place a bush there and a flower there. I'm just kind of listening to music and just like feeling it and just doing it, uh, which is also very much the approach I use to like compose music, which is like mostly my background. So maybe that has something to do with it. But yeah, you just you get to a certain point where you just you're just in a flow state and you know exactly where to put every little piece and it's just it's not you don't have to think about it. Yeah. It just works. It just comes together. Yeah. Totally. There's a lot of questions about the waterfall. Um <laughs> the waterfall was a favorite piece apparently um so to combine a couple of these uh they're wondering first is the waterfall custom and if it is uh do you mind spilling some of the secrets on how you went about that because and i agree it is really really beautifully done well it is not custom <laughs> that we it's it's on the it's in the marketplace so if you like that waterfall That's... you can get it yourself Perfect. It, just, it fits perfectly with the aesthetic we were going for, so we were really happy to get to find something like that. Yeah, it yeah. really does, because I, I fully agree. It looked like it could have just been custom made by you for that specific game. It fits in mm -hmm. amazingly. Yeah, I read a lot about, like, it's it's kind of controversial for some people to, like, use any, like, store-bought assets, but for us as, like, a two-person team, like when something like that already exists and it fits in perfectly with the assets that we already made, like why not? Like it just saved like a week of making our own and it and it really does fit in perfectly with the, the aesthetic. So yeah. yeah. I com I completely agree. If there's, you know, something you could do to cut down on the work for you, especially as a smaller team, take it. 
<laughs> Absolutely. Take any shortcut you can. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Tom Wallen was wondering, is it a clear boundary or do you use the environment to obscure the divide? I'm struggling with what that I'm not what sure means I by that. Either. Like, the boundary between um, what and what? Probably just between the different um sections of the level i would imagine oh oh does, does he mean like the entire map is it a yeah does he i mean, would like, think are so all the that's maps how i'm seamless? taking this mm. oh, okay the the maps are all uh, separate if that answers the question so like as you as the screen fades out and then fades back in it's it's unloading the current map and loading a new map what workflow do you use to both work on the project together? That's an interesting question. Um, so right now our collaboration hand. tool is uh, Perforce. Um, and a little bit of just like, hey, I'm working on this file now, please don't touch it at the same time because you know life That's happens. <laughs> um, it's not ideal. I won't like, I won't, <laughs> I won't advertise our method to anybody. Um, but it works for two people. If our team was bigger, uh, I'd, I'd probably have to more seriously think about a way to collaborate. Um, but for now, it works. It's not the most structured, I'll say. Yeah, in general, so. we're working on completely different things. So yeah, mm. yeah. we don't conflict very much. And with the two of you, it's easier to just send a quick message of, hey, please, please leave it alone. I just need it for 30 minutes, you know? <laughs> exactly. Right. Um, do you have, and I, I know you're still working on it, but do you have an estimated size of the game? Um, do you have an idea for maybe how long you think it'll be, any requirements like system requirements people might need things like that um so lengthwise uh for like single player playtime we would love to hit 20 hours it's still it's we can't promise anything yet because there are still a lot of decisions to make that's our target um and system wise we're aiming for like the lowest that we can do there's still work to be done on optimization in that respect but um like we it's really important to me just that it runs on like as weak as a machine that it should be able to run on. I want to make sure that we're doing things as efficiently as possible with like the graphics and any other systems that are running that people can run it if there's no good reason why it shouldn't. Um, and I'm just saying that because I believe that there's no reason it shouldn't be able to run now, but but there when we test on really weak machines now, it's like it's still not hitting that mark. Um, but that's that's normal at this stage in development anyway. I'm kind of rambling, but the, the point is we're going to aim for low low as we can for PC so anyone can sure. play it. Yeah, understandable. Um, this next question is an interesting one because it's, uh, I feel like it's maybe hard to answer, but obviously this is being developed in UE4 at the moment. And uh, they were wondering if you plan on updating to Unreal Engine 5 at any point, and um, if yes or if not, the reasoning behind that choice. Um, yeah, I can talk about this a little bit. So I actually did try to upgrade to Unreal Engine 5. Um, this would have been like months ago or half a year ago or something. Um, and it broke a bunch of features. Um, and like I expected that. I'm not. I'm not even. I'm not upset. Like I, I fully expected that. I did the upgrade because I wanted to see what would happen. Um, mm -hmm. The the issue is just that for this kind of game, the features that Unreal Engine Five is offering, I maybe I'm I'm not up to date, but it doesn't seem like there's anything that would really improve the current workflow we have. So I just I don't want to mm -hmm. mess with it, what we have now. Um, if in the future they do unveil some amazing feature that would then no question, I'll, I'll 
do the work and to fix things, but it just didn't make sense now to, to commit to it and, and fix all the systems that need to be adjusted for it to work in UE5. Yeah, makes sense. You know, it's if it's perfectly functioning the way you're hoping to get to right yeah. now, then <laughs> no need to throw a wrench into things. Mm -hmm. Uh, what was the most difficult part of the project thus far, uh, Fractured Fantasy is wondering? Most difficult part? I guess I can answer it, then Daniel can answer as well, because we'll probably have a different yeah. most difficult part. Um, Daniel, do you want to answer first? Can I think about this? Oh, I was I thinking, I've been answering. thinking by myself, but, okay. um, yeah, no, I guess, like, my my answer is pretty easy, like um, just not really coming from a very technical background, just kind of overcoming some initial like learning curves of like um, how things all work together and kind of finding a way to like build a new workflow for myself um, when I am coming from kind of or just coming from scratch. Um, I would say, and that's that's an ongoing challenge that always gets easier, but yeah. Um, for me, so I don't know if this is going to be surprising or not, maybe not to game devs, but but keeping up with social media is probably the hardest part. Um, oh, like, wait, yeah, that's mine keeping, too. Like, <laughs> It's a lot of time and energy just going into making sure your game actually has like a market and an audience. It really takes a lot of energy out of me and Daniel too, as he said. And like, yeah, by far that's harder than all, all the technical stuff. Um, yeah. Just it just yeah. No, I totally like it really agree. Just, yeah, it takes me out of my skin a little bit. We definitely like we make it a point to try to respond to like every message and every email and every comment we get, um, which I, we kind of create that challenge for ourselves. But like for us, it's really important to like, you know, people are putting themselves out there to like give us a nice comment or like give us feedback or whatever. And so we kind of feel like we owe it to them to like return the favor. Um, but it does add a lot of work for a two-person team. And as the game kind of gets more eyes on it, especially with the Kickstarter right now. Um, it's been really, really hard to keep up with everything. So, yeah, in the future, like, maybe we'll, like, hire a social media manager or something. Um, mm -hmm. We scale up in that way. But, like, yeah, and I think that's really hard in general for indie devs, especially as you're starting out, to, like, put your project out there and, like, get people interested and invested. You have to be posting, like, constantly, like, every day, and it just takes up so much time for development. And it's worth it in the end, but, yeah, it it needs to be done. There's so many it other can be, great it can be tough. projects out there. Yeah. Like when I first started sharing the game, um, I, I think if you scroll back all the way on my Twitter feed to like a long time ago, you'll see like tweets just weren't doing well. And like I was trying to like get people excited, it just wasn't going well. Like that, that was tough uh, for a while. I took a break from social media. Like just like all of that together, it definitely was harder, the hardest part for me. Um, yeah. yeah. It's it's basically its own job, you know? It's mm -hmm. <laughs> the amount of time and dedication that has to get put towards it. So like it's difficult. I can only imagine trying to balance that while also literally building a game at the same time. <laughs> yeah, it's not fun. Yeah. Not fun at all. Um I mean we like interacting the with the guy. Community. Yeah. Yes. So I don't want to say that's I not can fun. Imagine. That is fun. Yeah, yeah. It's just like yeah, the quantity yeah. of it can be overwhelming. Yeah. <laughs> you mean you, you just get a, a bajillion different notifications and comments for you to reply to isn't overwhelming? What do you mean? <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, ultimately, it's really heartwarming to see like all the positive comments and stuff. I think like what is most overwhelming would be like, people reaching out under kind of false pretenses and then they like want something from you. Like it's like actually like a business inquiry for some like, you know, there's a lot of messages we get that they're like, oh, your game looks great. And we're like, oh, thanks. That means a lot. And they're like, so are you looking to, 
I don't know, put your game on the mm-hmm. blockchain or I can help you put NFTs yeah, in your game please, or whatever. It's like Please nobody send us blockchain stuff. Please stop. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you have to worry about anybody from our chat sending you blockchain, mm-hmm. but it is we'll we'll get the vibe out there into the universe, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> cool. Uh, not the tech guy. Uh, I still love that name. Always will. <laughs> Any advice for those looking to venture out and make their own game, or for working remotely with others? Um. Make your own game, learn to program like C++ if you can. It's probably the number one advice I'd give. Um, like no matter the tools you have, it's all based on that. And like the, the, the better that you understand the fundamentals, the more able you'll be to do what you want to do. It's, it's that simple. Um, advice on working remotely. I can't think of anything. I don't know, Daniel, you have any thoughts on that? Um, I mean, I think it's in this day and age, it's hard to like meet people to collaborate with because um, you kind of have to meet people online. Like Ryan and I met through Twitter and, you know, the circle, back, not the so, circle back to social media again. But yeah, it really does come down to that. Like, I think you need to like be able to offer more than one thing. So like, yes, learn programming, but don't, not to contradict you, Ryan, but don't just learn programming. Like, learn to do two things or three things, and then you'll more <laughs> easily be able to find people that want to work with you. Because um, these days, like, so many indie games, it's like tiny teams, and they need people that can kind of wear multiple hats. It's true. Yeah. And don't be afraid to learn, I guess, would be the other thing, right? Because there, like you said, there's a lot of hats to fill. So, <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah, for sure, learning is the is the fun part. And like, you know, if you if you look at our game and it's like, you know, we we're both doing it full time or whatever, but that wasn't always the case. Like Ryan was doing started doing this on the side, just like tinkering with it and like experimenting, and he spent like over a year doing that, like a lot of time or even longer, really. And you can spend as long as you need, just like take the time you need to learn and you know, there's no one, there's no pressure. Like, you'll get to this point eventually. Give it yeah, that, that reminds me of one other point I guess I'll make in general, don't rush features. Like, if you're, if you're trying to make like a text box, for example, and in your head before you do anything, you imagine it working a certain way, don't stop when it works like 25% of what you imagine because it's technically done and you want to move on. Like, you really want to commit that time to fully achieving that vision because that's where you're going to do like there's a reason you want to quit so you really have to push through that if you get in the habit of stopping things early like you're not going to finish anything or you're going to end up with a game that's just full of half finished parts and it's probably not what your dream game is so yeah i I just i'm just saying that because i see a lot of developers like they sort of meet the bare like minimum requirements for making the features they're trying to do um but it's like it's pretty clear they just kind of moved on instead of actually finishing it. So don't do that. Check it out. Get it done. Mm. Um, there's a couple. There's two more questions that I'm gonna toss okay. at you. I know I've been barraging you with a ton, but I only have two okay. more. <laughs> um, the first one. Uh, Fractured Fantasy again is wondering who did the art on the incredible poster behind you, Brian? <laughs> oh, that's a that's a really good question. That's uh, Annalise. She she's an artist that we met through Twitter, I think. Right, it was on Twitter, um, and uh, yeah, she she made this incredible art. Uh, if you want to see like the full Great. thing, it's all over our social media, and you can see it. And yeah, we should just put a link her, to her Twitter handle in the if you guys can like put that in the YouTube stream. She deserves a shout out. For sure. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. she she did the cover art and she's also helping with the, us with uh, character design as well. She's she's just like an extremely talented artist. So. Yeah. It it is right 
It's beautiful. It's also just a fantastic poster. <laughs> I know we've talked about it before, but it is so huge and amazing, it's, and I love it's it. It's <laughs> touching the ceiling in here. Yeah. I, uh, I don't really know what to do with it at this point. Maybe we'll have a giveaway or something later on. Because. <laughs> That'll be cool. We'll see. Yeah. Um, and then last question, and this will be for both of you, of course. Um, so as developers, what kind of emotions and experiences are you looking to give your players through the atmosphere and story that you've built? I want players to laugh and hopefully minimize frustration. I, I, it's hard to answer this. I'm trying to, in my head, the emotion I'm trying to reach is the emotion I felt when playing Paper Mario as a kid. It's, just, I, it's a very specific kind of feeling, I guess. It's like it's sort of like this cozy feeling. You lose, you get frustrated, but you feel like you're in good hands the whole time while you're playing the game. Yeah, it's hard to explain. So, something like that, if that makes any sense. Yeah, it's like Absolutely. nostalgia and warmth kind of bubbliness, mm -hmm. like, you know, it's it's a fun, cute game, and you can just kind of relax and just, like, play and be in a different world for a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. And I could absolutely tell that from the demo that you brought, because it was, it was adorable. I can't even count the amount of times I was just, like, Fit, literally clutching my pearls, just oh, it's so cute, you know. <laughs> so it, I, I would say that you're succeeding thus far in the feeling that you're trying to convey through your project. Thank you. Good. Yes, thank you. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, before we wrap up, then, do you have any other final? comments, shout outs, anything that you would like to give to the people before we wrap up for the day? Um, you can support us on Kickstarter, as Daniel said. <laughs> um, that's all I have to say. <laughs> if, if you yeah, like, I mean, if you want to know see, more about the game, check us out. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even if you don't want to like pledge, you can go to the Kickstarter page and just scroll through. We have a lot more information about the game and like what you can expect um, if you're interested in like reading more about it. So, yeah, thank you so much for for watching. Yeah, yeah. thanks to everybody. Absolutely. There's also, if I remember, y'all have a Discord as well too, right? If people want to try and follow along as well. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want the link? I think I nabbed it earlier. Um, oh, cool. But I wanted to make sure we could shout that out to you just in case that was something anyone's interested in as well. Uh, but yeah, please, everybody, go check out the game. It's super cute and adorable, very well made, and looks like a ton of fun. I'm very, very excited to see how the development of this goes. I'm going to be following along, very curious and happy, and probably tossing in a pledge myself just because it's. It's such a fantastic project, and I, I'm really excited to see where you both take this. I really am. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Of course. And also... Thank you both so much for taking the time to come and speak with us today. This was a lot of fun being able to not only see the project, but kind of get into the meat of it, dive into some of the stories and experiences that you've gone through is really valuable for all of us to be able to hear and explore. So thank you so much for taking the time to come and be on the show today. Also, thank you everyone who came and watched as well. The show wouldn't be what it is without you and your participation and your questions. So thank you for taking the time to come and hang out with us and watch. Uh, with that, we post all of our streams in video format that can be viewed on demand on both Twitch and YouTube at Unreal Engine, as well as you can come follow us at Unreal Engine on all social media. And don't forget to come say hi on our forums where you can get the latest news and find all of the links associated with today's stream. But with that, again, thank you. Thank you both so much. This was so much fun. And for all of our viewers, we'll see you all next week. Thank you all. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you.